Hello everyone, this is going to be a continuation video to my previous one about interrupts, so if you haven't watched that, I recommend doing so, as I'll be using terms from that video that you may not be familiar with, and the link to which you can find in the description below. In this video, I'll show you how to use and code interrupts in MPLAB by showing you examples on external interrupts. But even though the main title of this video is external interrupts, this video is more about how to code interrupts in general, so there will be a lot of explanations about interrupts in between. So feel free to use the video slider or the description below to jump to any part of the video. So let's get started. I've explained the workings of the interrupt diagram and the relevant registers and bits, but coding that is another story. There are some things you have to be aware of, which I'll explain along the way. The previous video was meant to show you the underlying concept and circuitry of interrupts, but the fact is, the way interrupts work between microcontrollers or even between modules may be different. You may for example have extra bits that configure when that said interrupt occurs. I can't possibly explain all interrupts in a single video, especially when I haven't even explained their source peripheral first, so I decided to explain them in their own peripherals as video instead. This video will be about external interrupt sources, meaning they aren't triggered via any peripheral, but instead are triggered through external means, which will also be relevant to the example I showed you in the previous video about button presses. But be careful, the examples I'm about to show you are specifically for this microcontroller, but don't worry, there are usually no differences between similar microcontrollers, and if there is any, it will be very minor, which will most definitely be specified in the datasheet, and the underlying principle will always be the same. In the upcoming examples, I won't be using the diagram, that was mainly meant to show you the working principle, I'll instead follow the dedicated datasheet sections for configuring them, which I recommend you do as well. Every datasheet will have a dedicated section for each interrupt source, and you should always read them before configuring any interrupts in the future as well. Also, I'll put a link down below for the code files, which you can download and copy-paste into your own code, to follow along or tinker with. I'll put them in TXT format so you can open them in text editor. But you can just change their format back to .c, like this. Since .c files are also plain text, this shouldn't affect them. I'll also specify which example code is relevant at the beginning of each example, so you'll know which one is which. The fact that they're called external interrupts makes this a bit confusing, since when I say external interrupt, it would make you think of any interrupt caused by external means. But they are literally called external interrupts. This interrupt source directly connects to a pin, and triggers an interrupt on either high to low or low to high transition, meaning if the pin goes from low to high state or high to low state, an interrupt will occur. Whichever causes it can be selected by the user. Their names start with int, followed by a number. This number will start from zero and increment for each external interrupt source your microcontroller has. This microcontroller has three external interrupts in total, meaning their corresponding names are int0, int1, and int2, which are connected to the rb0, rb1, and rb2 pins respectively. Remember from the previous video that int0 is always high priority, while int1 and int2 can be set to either high or low priority. Before we start with the examples, I'll quickly tidy up the circuit I've been using, to make it easier for you guys to see everything. I also realized that I didn't mention these wires I've added in a previous video. I just added them so that I can have access to the power rails on the left side as well. The twist doesn't really have an effect for something like this, I just thought it looked cleaner. I'll just swap the jumper wires with single core cables one by one. The circuit is still the same, I'm just making the connections lower profile and more organized. I'll also shorten the leads of the resistor and capacitors to make them lower profile as well. While I'm at it, I'll also add another breadboard to the mix for more space. It will make the connections cleaner and give me more real estate in general, which we'll need in the future. I'll also tie all of the power rails together, so that I can use all of them. And lastly, I'll add 22 microfarad capacitors to the end of the power rails. These aren't strictly needed, and the value I chose is arbitrary. It's just that breadboard rails have relatively high resistance, so I want to give lower impedance power to the parts connected far away from the source, so it's just more decoupling in general. And there we go. Alright, let's start with the examples. For the examples, I'll configure these 5 pins at the bottom right as outputs, and connect resistors and LEDs to them so that we can see their states. Then I'll add a button to the RB1 pin, and configure it as input, 
Remember that this pin also has int1 functionality. I'll pull the pin low with the 10k resistor and connect the other end of the button to 5 volts. This way, this pin will stay at ground level, but whenever the button is pressed, it will go to 5 volts. I won't add any capacitors or anything to the button circuit for the bouncing. For that, I'll just add tiny delays in software instead. What I have in mind is that, out of these 5 LEDs, only one will be blinking at a time, while the rest stays off. And I'll use this button to cycle through which LED blinks. What I mean is that, when this button is pressed, the LED above will start blinking instead, and so on. And it will wrap around when it reaches the top one. Before we do any interrupt examples, let me show you why you need interrupts really quick. This is gonna be the int example 1. Let's do this example without interrupts by constantly checking the state of the RB1 pin. You know the drill. Let's first handle the IO configurations. I'll put this code in an FCOM to be able to fold it. I've talked about this in the useful shortcuts video in the series. I'll configure the 5 pins at the bottom right as outputs. Then I'll connect these outputs to ground since lat bits don't have initial states. Then I'll configure the RB1 pin as input while also clearing its end cell bit to make it a digital one. Now we can fold this code using the minus symbol at the beginning of the fcom statement. In the while one loop, I'll write our blink code, which I'll also put in an fcom statement so I can fold it. I'll create a global variable called selected pin to keep track of which LED to blink. In the blink code, we'll check the value of the selected pin variable and blink only one of the LEDs accordingly by toggling their corresponding lat bits between some delays. The value 0 to 4 will be assigned to the LEDs like shown in the diagram. We don't need to clear the lat bits for the other LEDs, since none of the if statements will exit before clearing their own lat bits. I know there are way better ways to write this code, but I'm prioritizing explicit coding over a short one, so you can easily inspect it. Let's also fold this and finally write our button check code. Remember that the input pin will be at ground level by default, and will go high whenever we press the button. So in the code, we'll check if the corresponding port bit is high, which will mean the button is pressed. And if the button is pressed, we'll increment the selected pin variable while making sure that it wraps back to 0 if it reaches 5. Then I'll put a 100 milliseconds delay for the bouncing. Let's program our microcontroller and see. You can see that I'm pressing the button, but the blinking LED is not switching. Even if I try to press it as fast as I can, it still doesn't switch. This is again because the microcontroller takes very little to execute this if statement, probably within microseconds, but blinking the LED takes one second total, so catching this if statement right when I'm pressing the button is very difficult. If you try it hard enough, you can get it to register your button press, but this is hardly functional. To prove that this code actually works, I can hold down the button, which will make it so that the if statement will always be true, and at the end of every blink, the blinking LED will switch. So you see, without interrupts, there is no way to reliably detect this button press and react to it. Now you may say, but you're artificially prolonging the code by putting these delay functions. That's true for this example's sake, but these delays can also represent a long list of code that takes a while to execute. So it's not exactly a bad example. Your code doesn't necessarily have to take a whole second to execute. Even if it takes a couple of milliseconds, which would be very common, you'll end up skipping some of your button presses, which still proves the point, making this kind of implementation unreliable. This time, we'll implement this example using an external interrupt. This is gonna be the int example 2. In the previous video, I've said that interrupt occurring is pretty much the same as a function call, only it's called through hardware instead, and the syntax also follows that idea. This is the syntax for interrupts. As you can see, it's just like declaring a function, but we're telling the MPLAB that this function is special and is meant to be put in the interrupt vector by using this underscore underscore interrupt specifier. Note that you need these parentheses as well. By the way, if you ever search examples on the internet, you may come across this syntax instead. This is the older way of writing it. The newer versions don't use this anymore and you'll get an error if you try to compile it. Also, I'll refer to this function as interrupt routine, so try to remember the term. You can call it the interrupt function, but they are commonly referred to as routines. Like I said in the previous video, interrupts work by storing the current values the microcontroller is working on, along with the current program location, and jumping to the interrupt vector. 
And at the end of this routine, the microcontroller restores the values back, along with the program location, and continues on from where it left off. In assembly code, you would need to do some specific things to make all of this work, but this is a beginner video, so I won't get into that. Luckily, in C language, the XC8 compiler handles all of that for us instead, so as long as you put your code inside of this special function, you don't really need to worry about anything else. Use void as the return type, since this function is called through hardware, so it doesn't really make sense for it to return anything. Also, the name of the function here doesn't matter. You can name it whatever you want, but like I said in the previous video, by convention they are referred to as ISR, or Interrupt Service Routine. So I typically put ISR here as well. So then, how about priority levels? From the previous video, you should know that this microcontroller has two priority levels for interrupts, right? And that one is called low and the other high priority. Also, don't forget that high priority interrupts can interrupt the low priority ones. As you can see, we didn't specify any low or high priority for this function. It's just called interrupt. If you use the interrupt specifier like this, it will be defaulted to high priority vector. This is because, remember, if you disable priority levels, all interrupt sources are directed to high priority vector, hence this is the default. To specify them as low or high priority, pass either low underscore priority or high underscore priority inside of this interrupt specifier, like this. I'll also change their names accordingly as well. This is going to be your high priority interrupt routine, while this is going to be your low priority one. If you don't have priorities enabled, you can still use the high priority routine and leave the low priority one empty. Let's do this example using the interrupts this time. We already have our button press code, so all we have to do is move it to the interrupt routine. I'll move it to the low priority routine for now because of the upcoming examples. Now here's the catch. Remember the previous video, you jump to the interrupt vector if a flag bit is set, right? You also have to manually clear the flags before exiting the interrupt routine. If you don't clear the flag, the second you exit this interrupt routine, another interrupt will occur, and you'll be perpetually entering and exiting this routine, unable to execute your main program. We'll talk about this more in the next example. All we have to do is clear the flag that causes this interrupt before exiting the routine. Remember, the interrupt source will be int1, so we can just clear its corresponding flag bit like this. By the way, I know that this bit resides in the intcount3 register because I looked it up in the datasheet using the search feature. You can also do the same when you start coding on your own. Now, we need to configure the microcontroller so that the button press causes an interrupt. Like I said before, don't use the diagram. Use the dedicated datasheet sections for configuring interrupts so you don't miss anything. Let's configure it up here. The dedicated datasheet section says that we can use the int edg bit to configure if the interrupt occurs on rising or falling edge. If we check the register it's pointing at, which is int con2, we can see the bit that configures that. I'll go with the rising edge so that the interrupt occurs when we press the button and not when we release it, which to me makes more sense. According to the explanation, we need to set this bit to do that. Now we need to configure its priority level using its corresponding IP bit. Like I said, we'll use low priority for this interrupt, and according to its explanation, we need to clear this bit to do that. Now we need to enable this interrupt using its corresponding EN bit, but before we do that, I recommend clearing the corresponding flag bit first, as also stated in the datasheet section. The thing is, the flag bits set even if you don't have their corresponding enable bits set as well. The enable bits only determine if they will go through or not, so the flag bits are actually independent. So, if you press the button before you start executing your code, the flag bit will have been already set, meaning the second you enable this interrupt, you'll jump to the interrupt vector, even though you haven't even started executing the actual code. This is a trap beginners fall into often. If you enable or disable interrupts, make sure to clear the flag bit before enabling them, so you don't jump to the interrupt vector for something that happened long ago, unless your application particularly requires that. According to this explanation, we need to set this bit to enable this interrupt. And now, we have this interrupt source configured. But remember from the previous video, we also have global interrupt bits we need to configure as well. First one is IPEN, which determines if the priorities are enabled or not. To enable priorities, according to its explanation, we need to set this bit, which you have to do since its initial state is zero. Otherwise, you won't be able to use low priority interrupts. Lastly, we have to enable the global interrupts, 
Remember that we need to set both low and high priority global interrupt enable bits to have low priority interrupts enabled. So we'll do just that. We can also check their explanations in the datasheet for that. Let's program our microcontroller. Now, as you can see, when I press the button, the blinking LED switches no problem, and the microcontroller never skips a button press. Whenever I press this button, the microcontroller stops whatever it's doing and executes this code, then returns back to where it left off, so no button press is skipped. One drawback, or feature, depending on your purpose, is that, because the interrupt is edge-triggered, even if I hold down the button, only one interrupt will occur, and the LED will only switch once. This is again because the interrupt occurs when the pin transitions from low to high state, not when it's just in high state. Though this can be solved using software, I won't get into that. This video is going to be too long at this pace, so I'll stop explaining the bits too much and focus on the examples themselves. I'm assuming you get the idea at this point. In this example, I'll show you how you can use both interrupt routines separately by introducing another interrupt, and this is going to be the int example 3. I'll go ahead and connect another button just below the one we've got here. It's going to be the exact same circuit, but remember, this RB0 pin has int0 functionality as well. This button will instead decrement the selected pin variable and move the blinking LED downward. From the previous video, you should know that int0 is high priority only, so it doesn't have a corresponding IP bit, nor can you change its priority. Let's write its interrupt code first. It's pretty much the same as the other button, but instead, we'll decrement the variable and wrap it around when it reaches minus 1. Also, we need to clear its interrupt flag instead, which resides in the intcon register. Now we can go up here and configure this interrupt as well. But before we configure its interrupt, we have to make sure that this pin is configured as input, right? Otherwise the button circuit couldn't pull this pin high or low. So let's go to our IO configurations and configure the RB0 pin as input, while also clearing its end cell bit to make it a digital one. Configuring this interrupt is the same as int1, except this time we don't have a corresponding IP bit, and these bits reside in the intcon register instead. We also don't have to enable the global high priority enable bit, since we already did that up here. Let's program and see. And as you can see, both of the buttons are working fine, and I can use the button below to move the blinking LED down. In this example, I'll show you how the high priority interrupts can interrupt the low priority ones, and this is going to be the int example 4. Let's modify our example to make it easier to see how the high priority interrupts interrupt the low priority ones. I'll just remove this blinking code, as well as this global variable. This time, I'll make it so that whenever we're in the main code, all of the LEDs will be turned on. And on the interrupt routines, I'll remove all of these codes and make it so that if a high priority interrupt occurs, only the bottom two LEDs will light up, while if a low priority interrupt occurs, only the top two LEDs will light up. I'll also put a large delay at the bottom of these routines to prolong them, so that we can see them getting interrupted. Don't forget, the second our microcontroller leaves the interrupt routine, all LEDs will light up by the main code here, so we'll know when an interrupt routine is finished as well. Let's program and see. Now you can see that if I press the button below, which causes a high priority interrupt, only the bottom two LEDs will light up, and if I press the button above, which causes a low priority interrupt, only the top two LEDs will light up. Because of the delays we put here, it takes two seconds for the interrupt routines to finish, but if I press the button above, then immediately press the button below, you can see that the high priority interrupt interrupted the low priority one. But if we press the button below, then the button above instead, you can see that the low priority interrupt didn't interrupt the high priority one. The high priority one still took two seconds to execute. Instead, the microcontroller handles the high priority routine, and at the end of it, immediately jumps to the low priority routine, since the flag bit got set anyway. Don't forget, the flag bits set no matter what, they are independent, even when the microcontroller is in a high priority interrupt routine. Now, as you can see, if I first initiate a low priority interrupt, then immediately initiate a high priority one, the button 2 LEDs stay lit up for longer than 2 seconds. This is because the microcontroller is going into the low priority interrupt routine, then executing this LED part of the code within microseconds, which I can't move fast enough to interrupt. Then I cause a high priority interrupt when this code is inside of this delay, 
and the microcontroller jumps to here. It executes this two second interrupt routine, but since the microcontroller got interrupted while in the middle of the low priority interrupt routine, it goes back to where it left off, which is in the middle of this delay, which adds to the delay up here. It might be tricky to get your head around this, but if you keep in mind the underlying working principle and follow the code step by step like a computer would, you'll understand how it all works. And of course, doing examples is the best way to remember or learn anything. This is going to be the last example for external interrupts, and it will be about how we can handle multiple interrupts on the same routine, as well as how we can enable or disable them during runtime. This is going to be the int example 5. Okay, say you have more than two interrupt sources, or you just don't want one source interrupting the other. How can you manage them on the same interrupt routine? Up until this point, we only had one interrupt per interrupt routine, so we didn't need to worry about this problem, because we knew the only source that could cause a given interrupt. But if you have two interrupt sources you have to handle on the same interrupt routine, how do you know which source caused the given interrupt? You wouldn't want to execute the code for other interrupt sources when an interrupt occurs, right? Let me move both button codes to the high priority interrupt routine. And of course, I need to change the int1 to high priority up here as well to be able to do this. I'll also put these LED codes in an FCOM so I can fit all of this code on the screen. The code itself is still the same. As it stands now, if any of these interrupts occur, both of these interrupt codes will execute, right? Now, how do we separate these two codes so that they only execute when their corresponding interrupt occurs? Just like how we cleared their corresponding interrupt flags, like these, we can also read their interrupt flags as well. To separate them so they only execute for their own interrupt, we can shroud them with an if statement that reads their corresponding interrupt flag, like this. This way, you can determine through software what caused the given interrupt. Make sure to use if statements and not else if so that you check each flag bit before exiting. Let's program in C. If I press the buttons individually, they act the same way as before, and you can tell that each interrupt executes their own corresponding code. And because they are in the same priority routine, none can interrupt the other. If I press both buttons one by one, the interrupt that occurred first gets handled, then the other. But there's a problem with this code. The problem is that we're checking their flag bits, but remember, the flag bits set regardless of their corresponding enable bit. If you only have one interrupt source per interrupt routine, there are no problems. The only way that an interrupt can occur is if both the flag and the enable bits are set. But when you have multiple interrupt sources per interrupt routine, like this, you'll have a problem. It's very common to enable and disable your interrupts during runtime, like for example, when you are configuring something and you don't want the buttons to interrupt it. I'll go ahead and disable the int1 interrupt source by clearing its enable bit up here. Let's program and see. You would think that the button connected to the int1 wouldn't work, right? And if I press it, sure enough, it doesn't cause an interrupt. But watch what happens when I press the other button. It executes the code for int0, but then it also executes the code for int1. This is because even though int1 didn't cause an interrupt, its flag bit got set anyways when we pressed its button, since flag bit set independently. It just didn't cause the interrupt. But if some other source causes the interrupt, like int0, we'll end up checking the flag bits for both, and since the flag bit for int1 was also set, we'll execute its code as well. To combat this, along with the interrupt source's flag bits, check their enable bits as well. Like this. This if statement will only be true if both the flag and the enable bits are set, which means unless the corresponding interrupt is enabled, this code won't be executed, even if its flag bit is set. Let's program again and see. And as you can see, even if I press both buttons back to back, the int1 code never gets executed. Before ending this video, I want to give you some extra information. First is about the use of global enable for interrupts. Because the GIE H bit can also disable low priority interrupts, it can be used to globally enable or disable all interrupts. Mind you that it won't enable low priority interrupts on its own. If the GIEL bit is not set, you still need to enable it, like this. Say that you have a code that can't handle being interrupted. There are a lot of instances where this will be the case, especially when timing is crucial. Many codes will malfunction when interrupted in the middle of its execution. Let's say you have this function called foo, 
and whatever it's doing should not be interrupted, and we're calling this function in the main loop. To prevent the interrupts from interrupting this function, you can clear the GIE H bit prior to calling it. Then, you can re-enable the interrupts by setting the GIE H bit again after the function call. You can also use the built-in functions or macros to do this, which are called EI and DI, which stands for Enable Interrupts and Disable Interrupts respectively. If you control click them and go to their definition, you can see that they are the same code. They just set and clear the GIE H bit like we just did. Don't forget, GIE H and GIE are the same bits. That bit just has two names, so this is just the same code. This is noted in the XC8 compiler user guide. Never enable or disable interrupts in the interrupt routine. When an interrupt is in progress, the interrupt controller already disables the oncoming interrupts and re-enables them before exiting. It says that re-enabling interrupts may result in code failure. I haven't tested this, but I'm assuming it's application specific, but following it is probably a good idea. You shouldn't have a reason to enable or disable interrupts in the interrupt routine anyways. Now, in these examples, I've been putting large delays in the interrupt routines, but you should never actually do this. I only did that for the example's sake. Interrupts, by nature, can interrupt your main code at any point. If your interrupts take a long time to execute, all of your code may end up being unresponsive. Care should be taken when implementing the interrupt routines. Now, this is a beginner video. I can't explain the best ways to implement your interrupt routines. It might get complicated, and it would definitely require its own video or videos. I'll eventually make project videos where you'll understand how to better implement them. But for now, I'll just say this. Unless your interrupt code is very small to begin with, it's common practice to create a software flag, which is just a simple variable that holds 0 or 1, and to put your interrupt code in the main routine instead. Then, in your interrupt routine, you can just set this software flag and exit, which will result in a small and fast interrupt routine. Then, in your main code, you can check this flag and execute the interrupt code, and at the end of it, you can clear this flag. This way, the interrupt routine itself will take little time to execute, and the bulk of the code can be handled by the main routine whenever the CPU is available. You may ask, what's the point of doing this? It's not easy to explain that without showing a complicated project, but the more experience you get, the more you'll understand why this approach is very common. You just have to think about what part of your code can and cannot be interrupted or delayed before the system seems clunky or unresponsive to the user in the end product. I'll just leave it at that. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.